All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy Barton. I have a PhD in physical chemistry and a background in biology from my undergrad. And for the last 15 years, I've been working on a stealth startup trying to build direct to diamondoid nanotechnology. And about three months ago, they cut half of our team because funding became an economic problem. When Adam referred to the Canadian company, briefly, that was us. And it was my responsibility to build the experimental program and run it. However, it's a secretive stealth startup. I cannot talk about any of the actual results that are not already public. However, our patents are public. And Adam had a couple uh, figures from one of those patents in there. So what I can say is that in terms of positional chemistry for my patents, I am quite confident that stuff like that works. You can manipulate and position atoms in at least two and plausibly three dimensions in order to build structures atom by atom. However, that doesn't necessarily get you to molecular machines by itself. And it's a long pathway to take one technique forward all the way to Eric's vision. So what I think we need now is an interdisciplinary institute that openly and publicly builds methods for developing and constructing and testing and designing got the order wrong, nanomachines of any sort, simple molecular motors, uh, basic structures that actually work together. But in particular, my interest right now is in hybrid technologies. Can we combine nanoelectronics work and single electron transistors and the atomically precise qubit work people have been doing in Australia and at NIST as sensor or wiring systems for you know, protein engineered molecular machines or supermolecular molecular machines. What I want to do, and what I'm doing now, is starting to build an institute focused on execution rather than planning. Starting from a systems approach, saying here are the problems that we need to resolve in order to achieve basic molecular machines, not, no applications just yet, and bringing people together from all of the disciplines who have a stake in this to actually sit down, not for two days in a workshop, lovely as those have been, and they've been essential, but for months or years at a time to actually build a coherent language where problems that have been solved in one field and pop up in another can be addressed across disciplines. Because often, we have different language for these problems. A problem that was resolved in electric electrical engineering 40 years ago pops up in molecular biology. And they just, you cannot tell that it's the same problem because we talk about it differently. So. I am actively engaged in pulling together an independent research institute. I don't even have a name yet. Literally, I've been doing this for the last couple months. And I think that that interdisciplinary work is what we need at this point in order to push forward. The output I want in five to 10, hopefully, years is an array of open source, well-published methods for building simple molecular machines. In particular, I want motors. I want motors that you've wired up to a computer that can switch back and forth and drive things. And then methods to assemble additional molecular components on top of those to start building machines. I am not interested at the moment in this institute addressing the big problem that actually blocks a lot of what Christine was talking about in applications, which is scale up. The big vision for molecular nanotech, Eric's big revelation, was that we are molecular machines. Right? Life has transformed the planet through the power of positional chemistry. Each of us is made up of like 100,000 different types of molecular machines that put together create these amazing people around us. In order to do that, you need exponential scale up. You need your ribosome that can make more ribosomes. You need your cells that can make more cells. We are nowhere close to having the level of control necessary to build exponentially replicating molecular machines. We have a few primitive examples of molecular machines that are nowhere precise enough and are far too slow and inaccurate. So we need design tools. We need sources of motion. We need motors. We need ability to control them, whether with light or electricity or magnetic fields or changes in the solution configuration, adding DNA strands, uh, changing the magnesium concentration, what have you. Personally, I want to use electrical. So that's what I think we need. We need a real focused interdisciplinary effort based around execution. So what I want to do is raise enough funding 
to build a centralized set of labs and start hiring postdocs and students and more senior people into that in order to start really pulling together an interdisciplinary group. I've done it before. We combined chemistry, engineering, surface science, and physics into this Canadian company. I want to expand that group, add the biologists, add the protein engineers. Let's not restrict ourselves to one technique and say this one approach, these you know, diamondoid positional chemistry approach will solve all the problems. Let's assess the problems and the various available technologies independently and figure out how to combine them. And ideally we have three to five different ways of making nanomachines. At the end of the day, we open source them, we leave it to the community to start the actual corporate efforts to derive commercial value from that. And at that point, I think it's going to be highly likely that the exponential scale-up program will have a huge amount of resources. This, I've been dealing with a secret startup effort for 15 years, and it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right? It prevents you from working with the people you need. It requires you to work through layers and layers of lawyers in order to make collaborations. It opens up so much risk. But at the end of the day, there is so much interest in the technical community, in the academic community. There are so many scientists interested in building these machines because of the work that Eric and Christine and Forsyth and Allison, everybody here have done to highlight the potential. If we can put all the atoms where we want them, what can we not do, right? If we can build, let's use diamondoid as an example, we'll, we'll pull from uh, nanosystems. If we can build structures that can do chemical separation at gigahertz frequencies, you are going to, every CO2 molecule that hits it goes into the tank. All right, now what do you power it with? Well, there are some lovely articles on using carbon nanotubes as optical diodes, optical rectifiers rather. Carbon nanotubes, that gives you, if you go into the microwave literature, you can get rectifiers up to like 98% efficiency. Carbon nanotube rectifiers currently are at about two, but this is a carbon sourced solar cell that in principle you could get up to 80 to 90% efficiency and it's cheap if you can put all the carbon atoms where you want them in order to build the solar cells. Route that power to your CO2 sequestering devices and you've got an ability to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere or you've changed the binding sites and you've got an ability to pull drugs out of a um, synthesis chain which cuts your purification costs. Whatever, there are umpteen bazillion applications. If you can build carbon nanotubes of sufficient length, you go over to NASA and work with them on the space elevator. Their first space elevator tether calculation was something like 60 tons. Okay, for 60 tons, we desperately need the exponential scale up. But there's a lot of stuff you can do without that. And I don't know what all of it is because I am not an uber genius AI system that could possibly interpret everything. So, Interdisciplinary Research Institute, bring in the scientists and coordinate and bring in the AI people as well. A lot of the more entertaining and esoteric AI people got into their field in order to do this. So let's work with them, right? We are attempting to build what you might interpret as the physical basis of the singularity. The AI can be super smart, but if it can't put the atoms where you want it, we'll get two of them. <laughs> That's not enough. Neurotech is always a fun one. Anyway, I have five minutes, but basically if we can build the right nanomachines, we can keep up. But to build the right nanomachines, we have to be able to build nanomachines. And that, I think, needs to start now. It needs to be open. It needs to be public. It needs to build a community and an ecosystem. And so I am going to start doing that today. Great. Thank you. Okay, questions, comments? We have one here. Hey, Jacob. Oh, it was great to finally meet you in person, Jeremy. Um, so I saw you vicariously taking notes. <laughs> yes, I think I have like five pages now. Okay, this is good. So, um, lovely talk. The two things that I'm just curious about, not as a criticism, but just curious. First, when you said funding, what is the ballpark estimate? Like, is this like six, seven, eight? 
So Canadian Banknote had a, uh, we got a government grant plus corporate funding of $150 million. That wasn't enough. Okay. So around that range, probably higher? I would go higher. Okay. How much would you say is a secrecy cost? <laughs> In time or money? <laughs> In money? Oh, huge amount. Uh, so much delay. So much wasted effort building relationships to have them squashed by legal. They couldn't even talk to people. Yeah. I vanished from foresight the moment Canadian banknote bought the thing. It was enormously wasteful. I think the second question was just, um, I, I think that the point that you made about kind of open collaboration between different disciplines, especially for problems that have been solved, like such as electrical engineering to molecular biology, thought that was fascinating. The only thing I would say perhaps as a comment is that um, I could see it quickly evolving into a lack of focus because you have all of these different people oh, and yeah. scientists say, oh, oh we might God, try yes. this weird thing, this weird thing, and uh -huh. then we have another one of these talks and it's like, well, why did that not happen? Uh -huh. So what are you thinking about? It's absolutely a problem, right? Uh, the social organization and governance of something like this, you have to start with a cultural basis, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to build a group that is more focused on solving the problem and more focused on the problem, specifically the problem of building nanomachines, than they are on uh, publishing the next little bit of academic wisdom. And that's a hard thing to do, right? People here have built companies, they've built organizations. Getting the culture right is really hard. And I can't say we succeeded, which is why I'm expanding my search here to people I'm looking for advice from. Hey guys, who's pulled this off? I would like some help. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Jacob. All Thank right. you, everyone.